quando vuole quando vuole parto ok ok so maybe while somebody is still uh, on their way we, we may already start so before continuing uh, uh, to describe uh, about the design process uh, I only wanted to make a couple of points uh, very quick uh, about uh, uh, the lab that we just uh, went through my first point is uh, I know it's not uh, easy <laughs> don't think in C when you're writing Python um, what you will find if you start studying actually the built-in functions in Python and how loops work uh, we know we just gave you some very short information but it's something that you can use for starting to read and then you, when you will see also the solutions uh, you will see that uh, in Python you will need uh, a lot of less uh, loop, loops uh, or for loops uh, to get the job done so in many cases uh, there are higher level constructs like slicing, uh, like methods, uh, like built-in functions that already give you some result that in C would force you to go through a loop Okay, so many, in many cases uh, you were fighting against the loop and loop indexes and so on, and uh, actually it, it, it's far easier. Okay? Uh, but we will learn that. The, just just to, to put this warning into your, your mind, uh, don't, don't think in C. No? Uh, your arrays or it's not C arrays which are just memory location. They are lists uh, which have, that have very uh, powerful constructs and that can do much more. Hmm? Uh, iterate, iteration may no, can also be done across lists uh, or in general any other collection. So if you go, want to go through all the elements on a list, uh, you don't need to go for i is equal to, or for i in range 1 to the length. That would iterate through the indexes. And then you need to pick the element. You can iterate directly through the list elements. For element in list. And then you will iterate, and every time the element will be, will refer uh, to the next element in the list. So it will be much, much shorter. Hmm? So just uh, start to. to in the shorter ways of getting the, the job done and higher levels way of thinking. Hmm? And uh, we will appreciate it later when we do something more complex that in C would require 27 nested loops uh, and here is just a couple of instructions. Uh, one thing which is difficult to fight, fight against uh, are strings. Uh, you will find it in Python, but you also find it in Java. Strings are immutable. So you cannot modify one element, one character of a string. You can only build a new one when you've joined the pieces together so that in the new one, in that place, there will be a different character. Seems strange, it seems inefficient, but uh, it's the way it, uh, it's done. Okay, so there are some data types which are immutable, numbers, strings, Basically, some data types that are mutable can be changed, like lists, sets, and dictionaries and tuples. Hmm? So it's, uh, you need to get used to those. Hmm? Um, another point before so actually we go into the topic of the of today's class is about the projects. Um, many are asking questions, and this is good. Uh, the, the the message that I gave to everybody is just upload all the ideas on the document. Okay. Uh, this morning I went uh, twice through the list of the projects uh, and made comments. Uh, I saw that somebody already replied. Uh, and tomorrow I make another pass so that we can have a sort of conversation on the shared document. So that we can get uh, to Thursday through, let's say, successive iterations and refinements and improvements uh, to have, uh, say, ideas where we can say, okay, go on, or sorry, a green light, uh, go on, take this as a project, and let's forget about the others, or some other project will be, say, deleted, say this is not, uh, or you, will, you yourself would be willing to abandon that, because maybe when you have more than one idea, one turns out to be better developed than the others. 
OK? So it's difficult for us to reply via email to everybody and to 27 different formats. I think uh, that working on, the, on that document is becoming difficult to read with all the comments, but uh, it has only to last three days more. <laughs> and so let's uh, uh, try to work on that uh, and close it. Even if you have incomplete ideas or more than one idea, I think it's useful for also for other people to read uh, other people's uh, projects. So your names are there, so nobody's going to steal anything. But uh, maybe there is a group uh, with uh, lack of ideas can find, find some inspiration from others and so on. Uh, but we will daily, at least daily, check all the documents and uh, reply to comments and insert comments to new projects and so on. Hmm? And uh, on, uh, so this is our promise in this day. In these days, and then on, on Thursday, of course, we'll try to close it and say, "Okay, this is the good one." It won't, it won't be final yet. Okay, remember, this is just until Thursday to have, uh, um, to fix the group and the title of the project, more or less the topic, the goals. Then you will still, you will still have more than one or nearly one week for developing the vision, so for writing it nicely. Hmm? So it's not the final version. We are on Thursday. We are closing the final versions of the group and of the main topic. Right. Hmm? Okay. Just to clarify, but don't think in C. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the idea of the process. Uh, last class uh, we were discussing about uh, requirements. Hmm? Uh, we, dis we saw that there are two types of requirements uh, in a system in general, in a software system or in a technical system, that we can call functional requirements and non-functional requirements. And we saw that functional requ requirements are those uh, that list uh, one by one all the modes of operation of the system, all the different things that the system can do. All the uh, functions, all the um, items that the user can see and the user can decide to use. The user, but maybe also some functions that are listed in the functional requirements, may be not uh, user visible function. Function that the system will do, but maybe they are not uh, directly uh, connected to some user interface. I don't know, a system will compute the best match between two different, uh, uh, the preference of the user and something else. This is a function, a function requirement. The system does something, computes some result, but this is not linked to any interface immediately. Maybe it can turn into a different action of the system. So uh, function requirements are linked to the word, to the verb to do, things that the system does. Non-function requirements are how the system, the constraint, which are the constraints, the additional quality, the attributes that uh, the system should have uh, while it's doing the functional requirements. Hmm? Uh, we gave some example last time about what uh, a system can do and how the system will do it. Hmm? Um, and we share that uh, functional requirements are mostly local in nature. So they're often localized in a group, in a function, in a module, in a web page, in a, uh, in a form, eh? or in some, some lines of code, while non-functional requirements are spread all over the application. Hmm? Um, OK. And uh, if we want to help us to write good requirements, what help can we have to uh, to understand whether the requirements we write, we're writing, are actually good or not. So these are some uh, criteria that we may use uh, to check whether the requirements are written in a good way. So uh, let's see all of these one by one. Good requirements, uh, well, uh, should be correct requirements, correctly written. I should not write a requirement for something that the system should not do. This seems uh, uh, even stupid. You may say, OK, it's, if it's a requirement, of course, it's related to what the system should, shall do. Um, 
actually, even if I think about the project that you started to write, uh, while you are writing, everything is easy. So it's very easy to say something more than what you mean, really. No, and so the requirement will be wider or more demanding than what actually you wanted, because a couple of words more are easy to write but are difficult to meet later. And uh, uh, this should be, just remember that the requirements are, I can see it as a double-sided document. It's a document which on one side will be read by the customer, by the client, by the user, on the other side by the developer. And the two, side, the two sides should match, right? So uh, a good requirement is a requirement in which the user is able to understand whether the system that I'm describing actually does what it needs. Hmm? And uh, it's, it's easier if we make a, we will talk later about traceability, uh, if it's easier to see how a given requirement, number 37, will match to the final system. Okay, do you see this button here? This button is in response to that requirement there. Requirement should be unambiguous. So every requirement has only one interpretation. There should not be two ways of reading the same requirement. And uh, uh, so let's uh, keep the prose very simple. Not make complex sentences, but very, very short and simple sentences. And uh, always use the same words uh, for meaning the same concept. So don't use synonyms. Uh, uh, don't use maybe uh, user and then customer and then client uh, when you refer to the same person. Don't use phone and smartphone and device when you refer to the same object. Okay, try to stick with a, a consistent usage of words uh, to minimize the confusion, to minimize ambiguity. Because if you are using two different words, the reader will not know whether you are trying to use them as synonyms just to make the prose easier, or you are actually thinking about two different ways, or two different objects, or two different uh, uh, times. Hmm? So it would be very boring if you write it like that. But then it will be easier to understand. Hmm? Um, ideally, requirements should be complete. So they should include everything that is needed. Imagine signing a contract and saying, these are all the requirements. The people who are developing the work will stick to this list. If you forgot to include something in the list, then the system that you will get in return will have some holes in that. And if you want to fill those holes, you need to pay extra, huh? because it was not in the initial list. You forgot uh, something. So, you, we should always double check whether the list includes everything we need, even the, the obvious things. Even things that, okay, I thought it was uh, normal to have it, but you need to specify it. And uh, uh, this is, is difficult even for normal uh, system behavior, but it's even more difficult for anomalous system behavior. So how the system will behave in case of errors, in case of user mistakes, in case of network connectivity problems, and so on. So do I require any specific behavior about the system in these cases? If I don't require something, so if I don't list any specific requirement, then who implements the system will be free to do, to do whatever they like including nothing, including not handling the error or just printing a message. Okay? So always think about what will happen next and split it in what will happen next in a normal case and what will happen next in the, in the error case. Hmm? Defining all the terms, unit of measures, and so on, but it's, we are engineers, so we should know it. Uh, consistency. Consistency means that uh, uh, there are no conflicts between different requirements. Hmm? Uh, you should not have two requirements that actually are in conflict. They ask uh, different things that cannot be satisfied at the same time. 
Uh, or you cannot have a requirement that requires something that is not feasible with the technology we have. Now you cannot uh, have the user, I don't know, press a button on a wall because there's no sensor there. Or uh, you cannot uh, measure a, qu a given quantity if you don't know that we, you will have a sensor to measure that. So, like, uh, you know, the, the, there are two ideas that pop up in many projects, counting people in a room and uh, localizing people inside a building. You can write them as a requirement, but there are no actual easy ways of doing that. So it's a requirement that is not met by current technologies. So you, we need uh, to work around that in some way. Hmm? Otherwise, it's a requirement that will never be met. Hmm? Uh, or maybe in many other cases, uh, maybe, maybe you have a long list of requirements, and what you write in one it, conflicts with what you write 10 pages later or something like that. So um, um, you just, you, just uh, um, you need to, to proof check it, proofread it, and, and cross check the, all the items. Uh, unfortunately, you know, for those who study these uh, software engineering issues, uh, uh, it's easy to say that a set of requirements should be complete and consistent. So having all the information and don't have anything missing or anything uh, uh, in conflict with each other or contradictory. It turns out that it's not so easy to do it. Now, it's easy to say, but it's not so easy to do it. So every uh, list of requirements we all, will always be incomplete, and there will be always some inconsistency between the lines. And um, it's just a fact of life. It cannot be perfect. What it means that we should, even if we did the best job of the world in listing our requirements, we should be ready to change it. We should be ready to say, OK, but OK, I forgot this one. I need to add it. Not 10 new requirements every day, but if it turns out that something is missing, or if it turns out that something actually cannot be done because there are conflicts, then we should, we, we, we may and we should go back and change the requirements. Just remember that when you are changing something, the requirements, all the work you did since the beginning may need to be revised because you are changing the beginning, so everything that follows may change. So changing requirements is possible. It's uh, actually necessary because wh while we are developing, while we are designing and developing, we will find something new to modify. And uh, you sh we should at least keep the consistency between what we describe in the requirement and what we are building. Hmm? And so it's, uh, it's something that needs to be managed very carefully. Hmm? Um, good requirements are ranked. What does it mean? means that if I have a list of 100 requirements, I should be able very quickly to point out number one, number two, and number three in importance. What is the feature number one of my system? Then, OK, I will have also feature number 97, which may be left out if I want from the system. So it's always. Uh, uh, Overthink it is an, is, a, is an incremental development. You have a system that starts with uh, thinking about uh, functional requirements, which are easier. A system come, uh, starts empty, with zero functional requirements satisfied. And then you start working toward the first one, then the second, and the third one, and so on. At a given point, you will have a minimal usable system. A system with just enough functionality to do something useful. Maybe stupid, maybe incomplete, maybe ugly to look at, maybe complex to use, or whatever you want. It's just the first step. But we should aim at having this minimally functional system as soon as possible. So the first requirement that you will put in should be the ones that characterize the specific nature of this first iteration. So that we can start very soon 
to check whether our, uh, whether our idea, which was wonderful in our mind, actually looks good when it starts uh, to take shape. Hmm? And then add additional functionality as we go. Uh, at any time, you will always discover that any project, any project, takes up all the time you have plus 20% more. So a project will never be finished. You will have to stop development because there's the exam, because there's the deadline for giving the system to the customer and so on. Uh, you should be sure that when you stop, uh, the features that you're missing that could not fit into the allowed uh, time are minor, are less important, have a lower ranking in your project concept. Okay? Uh, I, gave, I gave several suggestions today in the documents. Try to focus more. This is the main feature, the main idea, and then, of course, if I have time, I can add more, which are related, which are nice, which are good. But they add on top of the key feature. Hmm? So always uh, have in mind, well, if you had to kill one of the or two requirements, uh, it should be clear which one to kill uh, for every couple of requirements. Which one should prevail over the other if there are problems? Technology problem, resource problem, timing problem, performance problem, whatever. Engineering is the art of fighting problems. And, uh, and in some cases, so you can also attach a concept of necessity. So some features are essential. Some are, okay, optional. Some are conditional. If these... Uh, this is useful only if this other feature is in. Hmm? So, for example, all the issue about, uh, if I think about our wake-up system, uh, all the issues about the um, sensing if the user is in house and so on, it may only make sense if actually we have the sensors. So if we decided that this, uh, having in our sensors is uh, low, a ranking feature, then a lot of other features that depend on it will, will, will be ranked even lower. So they are, they are not really independent, all these requirements. But the main message here is uh, always be ready to decide which uh, requirement to kill if you have to kill something. And the good requirement is also verifiable, it means that uh, anybody should be able to check your system, the final system, and uh, one by one, checking every requirement, uh, mark it as satisfied. Why? Uh, sorry, how? By doing some testing, by doing some operation. Some operation whose result is uh, non ambiguous. Uh, I can say that, uh, I don't know, the system will uh, adapt to the user preferences. Okay, what does it mean? How can I verify it? I can see a user and the system will react in one way today, and tomorrow it will react in a different way. What does it mean? Does it mean that the system is able to follow user preferences? No. It means that the system behaves in different ways. May also be random. Uh, so to be able to check a requirement, I, I need always to have in mind how to check it, what I am measuring. What do I want to see? Like, let's, let's make an example. Take a user that today likes the color green and then changes the profile, tomorrow likes the color white, and when he enters the room, the, I don't know, the color of the light will be different from the day before. So I can check that. So to clarify what I mean with a requirement is always useful, if not to write it down because it gets too long, but at least now in our mind to think, how can I test it? What is the sequence of steps that I should do to check that this function is actually implemented and it's implemented correctly? And it's not so easy for many of them. 
But it's also a good check whether the requirement is described with sufficient detail. Otherwise, uh, it's too vague, too fuzzy, too general, and it doesn't cor correspond actually to something specific. It may happen, because at the beginning, we still don't have very clear, clear ideas huh, about, it. We are, uh, about what, what the system will do in the sp specific cases. That's why we are not asking the requirements today, but in a month or so. Because there's work to do, brainstorming analysis to do, to actually to decide hmm, what the system should do. And the requirements, we said before that uh, the requirement document is not perfect uh, the first time through. We should need be, we should, we should be able to modify it. And so a, a requirement document should be, in some way, easy to modify. So very schematic in nature, with numbers, items, and maybe attach an history. So if you delete a requirement, uh, just don't drop it from the file. And then we use its number with, for something else. Because that number maybe has, is already used in some comments into the code where the programmer tried to write some code to implement it. So if you delete something, you just mark it as deleted, write it, retain the document, add another one below with a different number, and so on. So try to be very precise huh? and picky and, uh, and uh, with to all these nasty details about these requirements. There's nothing wrong in saying that uh, a, a, do a requirement document has changed three times uh, from the time you submitted it for, to us, for example, to the final exam. It's normal that you change it. Uh, it's important just to, to track these changes. Otherwise, we, you will end up with a system with the, in which one part was implemented according to a set of requirements and another part. And, uh, and by the way, we show when, let me say it this way, after we write the requirements for our system, we should remember to read them too. Because what happens is that we, we write very good requirements, and then the team starts working on something else, and not on implementing those specific requirements. If, I ch if we check the final result with the documents that you wrote two months before, uh, in many cases, they, they don't match. It's normal. People tend to diverge. So if we diverge, if we want to change what the system does, we are free to do it, but we need to update the requirements. Otherwise, we'll be, we will get in trouble. Even, just think again, the, in the contract, if you give this requirement as a contract to somebody else doing the work, when is the work finished? When is the project finished? When it satisfies all the requirements. But if you are implementing something else which doesn't quite really match the requirements, when is it finished? Never. We don't know. Hmm? Um, traceability of the requirements says that uh, it should be possible, as much as possible at least, uh, to track uh, the impact of every requirement uh, down to the code level. Say, OK, this statement is there. This data structure is there. This uh, icon in the user interface is there to satisfy that requirement and use it in the, in the comments of the code also. So it's easy to say, OK, what is the impact of, of modifying one requirement, or the cost of adding one new requirement, or if you drop or delete one of these, how much code you can simplify, and so on. Uh, Sourceability is a normal concept in all uh, modern let's say, engineering, even for goods, for uh, physical items. No? You want to know where this uh, has been assembled and where they build, uh, where they bought the, um, the the materials from, and so on. No? We want to trace everything so that if something wrong happens, you can you could go back and see and check what was the cause. And the same goes in software. It's more difficult because we need to do it explicitly by ourselves, but it's also important. So this is uh, just a, a quick presentation about this uh, general um, 
qualities that a good uh, set of requirements should have. Of course, uh, the, in, in this course, we are not doing as a full software engineering uh, methodology, so we will not be extra picky about all this. Huh? But uh, uh, keep, keep, keep them in mind for yourself, OK? It's an important step. Uh, and where are all these requirements written down? Usually, what we can imagine is having a requirements document. A huge document where everything fits in. By the way, there are also international standards that tell you how to write this document, how to structure it. Um, this is a, an example of the information, of the type of information that needs to go into this requirement document. We will uh, make a simplified version out of that. But just to understand, point one, the purpose and the scope, in some way, is more or less what we call the vision. So one page that tells everything about the users, the stakeholders, and what the project is all about, and what it's not about. So defining the scope, the perimeter in which the system will lie. It's important to set it very straight at the beginning. It's already, this page, we already called it the vision of the project. It's the same information there. But when you open the requirement document, you say, okay, what is it about, what it will do, who will the, user, who will the users be, so what user categories we will have, who will the stakeholders be, and what the system will solve, and what the system will not try to solve even by chance. Hmm? What is in, what is out. Out usually is more important than in. Okay? We should have one or two ins, key features, and be very, especially in the first iterations, be very strict about leaving out everything you don't need. Don't try to pull in everything at the beginning, because otherwise you will get a very uh, strange project with no, with no head or tail, but all, all garbled up. It may be useful to have a sort of a glossary. So, uh, what, sorry, what is the user? What are the users? Uh, when I talk about device, what do I mean? Do I mean a sensor? Do I mean a, a user terminal? Do I mean a, what, I, what kind of sensors or what kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, there were people talking about uh, the rooms of the Polytechnico. Which rooms? Study rooms, classrooms, toilets, bars, offices, okay? So we are free to define our own terms. I won't be offended, anybody would be offended if you define by room, toilets. Okay, so in this document, when you talk about rooms, we always talk about toilets. Okay, it's your choice of words. Huh? But then be consistent. So in one page, let's try to define the terms that will come over and over again in the document. Um, I don't know, other example from the project. The schedule of a student. I read it many times today. The schedule of what? Of the classes? Or the sports? The general calendar that the student may have? Or just the classes that are or, uh, that you can see on the portal, the classes that are recorded, that are registered according to your own courses, or something else that you can personalize. So while reading the project, I had to, to second guess, oh, maybe it meant this. I imagine that the most reasonable definition would be this. But maybe you had something else in mind. And it happened many times when he said a comment, I don't understand this, and then the people replied, oh, but yes, but he wanted to say this one. OK, the thing. OK, now, now it's clear. OK? And, and so in the final document, always try to be as explicit as possible. Then there can be a list of use cases. Use cases are, are a very, very good uh, technique uh, for expressing functional requirements mainly. 
Use cases are short stories about uh, all the possible ways in which the users may interact with the system. Telling stories is easy. And uh, you see what the user will get from the system when the user is interacting with it. So it's a way of specifying what the system will do when the user walks in, walks in, when the user presses a button, when the user queries uh, some words or whatever. Hmm? Um, so it's, it's one technique. We will not develop it much because our systems te will tend to be very focused, uh, so don't have, uh, they won't have millions of different use cases. But in general, it's a technique that, that work, works very well. Just remember, again, that also the users of the system, or the class, clients, the customers, should be able to read this document. So for least in the functional requirements, you cannot speak the language of computer science. You cannot talk about packages and functions and modules and objects and classes. Not yet. Or interfaces or, or widgets or pages or uh, Android activities or whatever you, we call the different screens that the user will see. We still need to talk a language that can be understood by the user and can be precise enough to be understood also by the programmers. It's not easy. Use cases are a good way because they break down the interaction in a set of steps, one after the other. But we won't get into details into, in this course. Later on, uh, once we define how the users will interact with the system, the next step is, OK, how can the system support the users in doing these things? How can the system support with technologies, with hardware, with software? Hmm? We will detail this better in the next step in our process. So it can be written at this step in the requirements document, but it's something that comes usually later after that. There may be also other requirements that don't stem from the specific uh, functionality for the specific project, for example, all the context uh, uh, requirements, security, business rules, and so on, but uh, uh, they are more for enterprise projects and also for the other. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> there is an, uh, an interesting uh, point called the human backup, uh, which is worth thinking about that, just commenting a word about this. What happens if the system doesn't work? If the system goes down, if you have a blackout, is there a human backup, a way to accomplish the, the task without the system manually? Or uh, will I be locked into, into the toilet all night, all night long huh? because the system is too intelligent to open the door for me and there is no alternative, manual backup or human backup for doing that? Okay, It's actually a, re a reliability requirement. But even simple things about that, I saw at least one house in which there was a, installed a smart home system where the doors were, could only be opened by motors. So they only are motors to open and close the doors. Uh, the issue is that uh, when you have some fire, for example, in your house, the first thing that the fire detection system does is to cut power. Okay? So if a fire was ever detected into that building, the, the effect was that people could not get out of the house by the doors nor by the windows because they, all, they also were, were automated. And people from outside could not go in to help them. Uh, they had to go and take a, um, a key and uh, open. There was a mechanism. It took 20 minutes, more or less, to open the door manually. Hmm? So that was, it's, it's, a, it's a corner case, of course. But it's something that we can think about. Uh, it's easier if we think 
to our systems as additional, something that enrich, improve something that we would do anyway in a different way, in a manual way. We do it better, we do it faster, we do it in a nicer way, in a more efficient way, and so on. But if it's missing, we, we, I don't want to replace something. It's very dangerous if we, we want to replace something completely. Make it better, not make it in a different way. Okay, so all of this uh, should be packed into what we call deliverable number two. Remember, deliverable number one will be the vision document, one page. Deliverable number two will be a, a document with the functional requirements and non-functional requirements. Okay, next week we will make a, an example together, so when we are less concerned <laughs> about all the projects, we'll make a, we'll have one hour and we will try uh, together to make an, an exercise on this. Because uh, one uh, issue that we saw last year is that people uh, had difficulty in understanding the difference between functional and non-functional. So the quality of this deliverable last year was very poor. So this year we want to spend more time in working together. Hmm? And so at, at the end of that uh, exercise, we'll have a template. Uh, so we, we hope uh, more or less during the, the weeks in which you will, work, we, we, the, you will be working on that, uh, so it may help you having so a, a, um, a scheme for working. Again, uh, every document or deliverable should be uploaded on a website, so don't send them, don't spam by email or something else. Uh, starting from the end of this week, so from the 20, you will all have access to your own website in GitHub. So we'll create the project for the groups, so everything will go, will go there, okay? So the Google Doc will only last until Friday, and then we move to GitHub. Every group will have their own space, their own website, and you all will upload that there. So we will check the websites and download the, docu the requirement documents and so on. The, the date is... Uh, just after the Easter vacation, if I remember correctly. And uh, uh, again, in 10 days, we will give you feedback uh, if needed and so on. Hmm? This usual process. So at this point, uh, we have, uh, we should have clear ideas about uh, what the system will do. Now, we just need to, to implement it. And so implementation is still, still needs a couple of steps before starting to write thousands of lines of code, or hundreds, depends on the complexity. First, we need to focus on the architecture. So right now, we, we assume that we have the functional requirement list set in stone. We don't change it anymore. And the non-functional requirements also. We know them. Huh? We will recite and spell them every night before going to bed. So they are the Bible. Now, the same functionalities can be implemented in many different ways. Everything in one big powerful server, everything scattered through 25 different raspberries that communicate with each other. Uh, something can be implemented in hardware, something in software, some, some algorithm may run locally in the classroom, in the Raspberry put somewhere, or can run on the cloud, where there's more powerful uh, uh, CPUs and more space for computing. Depends. We need to do a lot of choices. So we need to structure, to, to give a structure to our project. It's what we call the architecture. So for a computer engineer, Architectures, architecture means uh, what pieces do we have how do we, and how they fit together. What pieces, what components? And components are hardware components, software components, network components. That's it. We don't have anything else in computer science. Hardware components may be sensors, may be actuators, may be in user interface devices, keyboards, for example, uh, lamps, LEDs, 
bytes, maybe computing nodes, hardware component, maybe a CPU, a component, a computer, put somewhere. And software components are all the different software modules, a web application, a mobile application, uh, an algorithm, a database. So the architecture is the list of all these components and how they fit together. Who talks to whom? The mobile application, does it talk to the Raspberry that we have in the field, or does it talk only to the cloud application that we have on the server? Who talks to whom? And what do they say, and what do they say each other? So what information they exchange? A big picture. Maybe I don't even decide in which language do I implement something. Or maybe I know. I don't care at this point. Which are the components? How they are related to each other? Who talks to whom? What do they say each other? And of course, the network architecture. What are the network requirements? Does it need to have a public IP address? Can it be on behind a firewall, behind an NAT, a NAT router? Or so, um, what are the main components? What is their nature? So, what they do? What's their name? And what kind of information they exchange? We may have centralized architectures. So everything is in one computational node, one computer that does everything. All the rest are just peripherals that send, receive commands and send data, but don't uh, decide anything, don't compute anything. Or maybe we have many computational nodes. So all the computation is split across where well, something happens in the server, something happens in the Raspberry, something happens in the mobile application, maybe. They are all legal choices, OK? It depends on what the system will do. It depends on how we decide to organize the work. Sensor actuators, how they interact with the world, how they communicate with the other nodes, where they installed, how are they interconnected doing the wire, is it wireless, which protocols, and so on. Where are the user interfaces, what can, what can I do, and so on. And Another verb here is deployment. Deployment in computer science means mapping logical functions to physical devices. I don't know. Uh, if I have a software that does some image recognition, I have an image recognition software algorithm that is deployed to the server means that it's installed and will run on the server, or is deployed on the mobile. So the same algorithm could run, needs an algorithm always needs a CPU, a computer to run. So which is the computer? It's what we call the deployment of an application. Installing and running on a, on a given piece of hardware. So actually, as I said, the hardware architecture means the computational nodes and all the devices. Devices may be environmental devices, so sensors and actuators, switches, lights, buttons, and so on, and user interface devices. Okay? Maybe more or less intelligent. A button is a user interface device. It's not very intelligent, but it is. But it's a device and it's, it's a user interface. A smartphone, a smartphone may have a user interface, so will can be used as a user interface, but we can also be used as a computational node in some case. A computer also can offer a user interface if we want to use it, can offer the computational power if we want to use it. Depends on how we use the resources you, we want. We don't need to decide yet the type, the model, the brand, or the specific device. But just uh, which are the main components and what's their role in the system? What we are expecting them to do for us in the system. Software architecture is the same, but it's more extra, so in some cases it's more difficult to describe. Major software modules, major blocks, major functions, software applications that do some, something useful and may interact with the other software applications that can run in the same device or in different devices. Hmm? 
try to I, I always visualize the things as, as block diagrams. A box that talks with another box with names and with the information exchange. So what a, a given software module does, and this is some way maps uh, to functional requirements. I have a software module that is able to do, I don't know, localization because the functional requirement tell me that I need uh, this information. Hmm? Traceability. When are they deployed and how they interact with each other? And usually, interacting for two pieces of software to interact, it means that uh, either or both have a well-defined API. API stands for Application Programming Interface, you know. So a set of functions that can be called explicitly by the others. <coughs> Later in the course, we'll see we learn uh, about a very easy technology to develop software that offers APIs to other device, to other software components, uh, or can call APIs from other devices, all on top of web technologies. Uh, usually, today, most of the say, cloud or web applications are using REST API over the HTTP protocol. For now, there are just acronyms for you. But it's a way of exposing functions. You know, an API can be, I have a program written in C with these 27 functions that you can call from your main. But this would be a very limited type of API. It's an interface to some functionality offered by some functions that are documented. But they can only be called from a C program linked with the my library. So it's very limited in scope. Here we are thinking about a distributed system where we have software running in different places. So we, but we need to be able to call easily and quickly a function running on a different module. So we need a way of publishing very easily the function over the internet so that anybody can call it and an easy way to call it. Okay? We will have to set up a set of, lay of layers of software layers to get that, but in the end, uh, we will learn how to, how to design these APIs and implement them. And when I draw a software architecture, maybe some blocks are already available. Oh, I found yesterday, by searching on Google or on GitHub, a very good algorithm written in Java that does, uh, I don't know, the, the estimation from a set of sensor data of the weight of the person passing by. I don't know. It's there. I know it's there. So it's one functional block that I will need to interact with it, of course. But it's already available, existing. In some other cases, we are just drawing a blocker that doesn't exist yet because we will have to implement it. Okay? But it doesn't, it doesn't change the architecture. Of course, if we know that some important components are already available, this will influence how we design the architecture, because we will try to accommodate or design around these systems that are important to us, and they are already done, huh? which is the best way of developing something, taking something that's already working. And then, of course, uh, libraries and frameworks can be chosen, but uh, they are a min minor detail of the architecture. So, just to make it more practical, uh, if we take our wake-up system, I try to draw a very simple top-level system architecture. System. At the system level, I don't see hardware or software. I see mainly big blocks. And then we'll break them down through, okay, what is the software that runs and what is the hardware that provides the capabilities. So what I, I, I saw here, I, I started from the user of the system, and I saw how the, the user interacts with the system. The user interacts with the system because it may listen to the phone ringing in the morning, or it may modify some settings by using his phone. So it's a bidirectional interaction. Where there are Two diff very different interactions. One is uh, explicit. I use the phone to change some settings. And the other is more implicit and more passive. The phone is ringing, so 
it interacts with me. I can be woken up by music. So there should be some block that generates music uh, that gets uh, uh, finally to the user. And there are some sensors in the ambient that can tell us something about the user. Of course, it's still general. We need to go into more detail and say, OK, which are the sensors that we are going to use? But if I have one or three or 17 sensors, they all do the same thing. They tell me something about this user. So from the block diagram point of view, they are all in the same place. And all this information about the ambient sensors goes, and also the settings of the phone, goes to a central server. So I imagine having a central server somewhere. In this picture, I don't show whether this central server is central to my house or central to the service provider. It's a central for, from a logical point of view. Everything, every data, every information goes there. Physically, I don't know where it is. Is it in my house? Is it outside into some Amazon server? We need to decide. We need to trade off the cost and the performance, the network connectivity. Having the central server inside my house it would be a problem when I'm outside the house to reach it. If my wake up system should work also when I'm in a hotel or somewhere else, uh, having a server in my house with all the information there makes it difficult because usually, unless you do some tricks with your router, you cannot get to the computers inside your network, inside your local network. So maybe something should be outside. Maybe something inside, depends. No? We need to reason about how to deploy the different functions. So on which, so we're starting to use this terminology, on which hardware to run different pieces of software. Of course, we'll have some web interface, because the person can be, should be able to do his, modify his settings or whatever, also through the web and not only through the phone. Maybe it's in office and can use a web, web application. Maybe in the web application, you can also see some historical data, some trends, something more uh, feature-rich than what you can do with the mobile application, which would be more focused. And we know already that uh, the schedule of this person should uh, affect, in some way, the choices for the system. And for example, it means that the user may have a Google Calendar available in which uh, he, that he duly uh, fills with all the needed uh, jobs he needs to do and the places he's going to be. And the central server should have access to this calendar. Not the sensor. The sensor don't care. Not the phone. It doesn't care. It's the server that needs to put together all the information about the sensors, about the phone, about the schedule, about the preferences, about the, the calendar and then decide, do I need to ring the phone? Hmm? So this is the first uh, draft of the system architecture. It's better to go in steps. But if we want to do, go in more detail, maybe we don't detail everything. We, we detail only one part. For example, detail of what's inside my house. When I break up the sensors, when I show the computer that is in my house, I show the network router, or something like that. Don't make one big, very complex picture. Make many smaller pictures that are easy to understand and then focus on different aspects one at a time. And by detailing this, I got sick of drawing pictures, so I made lists. Uh, the hardware, this was the system architecture, general picture. Then the hardware architecture. What are the pieces of hardware? Ambient sensors. OK, which ambient sensors? Well, maybe some moving sensor in the room that sees if somebody's moving. Some sensors under the bed, weight sensors, or movement sensors, depends. We are still defining the architecture. So the, I. 
what is clear to me is the goal of these sensing devices. Understanding whether the person is awake and or understanding whether the person is still in the bed, which are two different concepts. You may be awake, but in the bed. Uh, many times uh, you are not awake, but you are already out of the bed, so you're wondering. But this is a more difficult situation to detect with sensors, very frequent. Um, because uh, if I know the person is up, then the wake up uh, may end. I, may, I can put some relaxing music, maybe, instead of something very uh, challenging. But if the person is awake but still in the bed, then I need to be very uh, nasty with him. Maybe I need some local computation, some local unit, um, a Raspberry or something like that, to be able to integrate the sensor data. Sensors are dumb, are stupid. They only give one number if you ask for it. So there should be some node on the other end that is able to get this information and transform this number into something useful. You need some logic. And to have some logic running, you need to have some computational node. Will you put the polling of the sensors on the mobile phone? Ah. The phone may be off, or it will, in any case, it will be wear off the, the, the battery, and maybe it doesn't have the radio protocol that the sensor is able to, to use. You will need one small CPU. So I imagine a Raspberry, that once we analyze better what we need to do, we'll understand better if a Raspberry is fit or not. But right now, we understand that if we have these sensors, we need something to read them. Then I have a mobile phone, and can specify better what kind of, of type, for example. <coughs> Sorry. I have a server, and uh, OK, uh, this server should have very large data storage for having all the historical data, maybe for many users. Uh, it may be able to interact with cloud services, so it should have internet connectivity to go to Google Calendar and get the information. The same server could generate the user interface. So you may have some part of the software. In the software architecture will be split in a part of the web front end and a part of data management, for example. And the server should host the intelligence. So actually, these are all the all the main some of the main software components that will be deployed on this server. And I imagine it being. A, an always-on system somewhere in the web, but not in my house. Always on, always connected, doesn't play well with the, in my house. Uh, maybe a better PC, maybe not. A PC, a physical one, connected to a network, a virtual server that we rent from some cloud provider, well, we'll decide. But for sure, we'll have some computational node outside our, our home with these roles which are different from these ones. Finally, music. It's in the picture. So how do we make some music playing? Again, we should have some node which is able to generate this music and play it on some loudspeakers or some hi-fi system, high-end system. But on the back, there should be some intelligence that pushes the uh, the, the right kind of music, the volume, and so on. So this kind of logic may be, it's again, a local node that gets orders from the cloud. It's the cloud that decides what music, or the central server, that decides what music are we going to play now and at what volume level. But then it must be inside your house to be able to command the analogical part, the power. The, the amplifiers and the AFI and the speakers. So one choice could be to reuse the same Raspberry that is already used for the sensors. So we have a small, can I call it home gateway? A small node in your home that acts as a gateway to all the different devices, sensors, loudspeakers, and so on, and talks to the server. So it does a very limited function in-house to manage the local devices and report to the central server. That's one possible architecture. I'm not saying it's the best one or the only one. 
It's just an example to see how we describe an architecture. The next step is the software architecture. So what are the, according to what we described up to now, what are the main software components? So we need some software to collect data sensor data. We know that it will be deployed in the local gateway. We just discussed it. And so something that is able to connect locally with the sensors and send all the data to the central server. All the data, some of it. Do I send the raw data, unprocessed data from the sensor to the central server? Or do I do some computation lo locally? If there is some insignificant data at 4 a.m. in the night, uh, I'm sending one sample every five minutes. Uh, or do I send something only if I detect some activity inside? Depends. I can do all the connectivity outside, and so sending raw data, unprocessed data to the server, or do some processing locally and send some already processed information, some events, not just data, but data with some attached meaning. Hmm? Depends on how we choose. If you are asking to some uh, cloud provider or telecom provider, they would love if you send everything up there, because you will pay more bandwidth and more computing power. Uh, if you ask somebody who cares about maybe more the, about the privacy, well, they would uh, prefer just to send the minimum amount of information outside and do most of the processing inside. It's a balance. It's a design compromise that we need to, to, to take. Hmm? Of course, we have some uh, music server software. Depends on the actually, actual Wi-Fi system that we want, but for sure it will run the local server, gateway, and it must accept commands from the local from the central server. And then we'll play locally. Um, so these two pieces of software will run locally. Then I have the app that will run the mobile phone that uh, allows the user to change settings, uh, will ring, and will also relay some information so the, about the sensors that are inside the phone to the system. So we have some sensors for free that always are with the user. Some will be clear. Then on the central server, we have different pieces of software, one web application for the user interface, some data storage for storing all the data and doing all the computation, inference, and so on, and detecting user preferences, behaviors, and whatever you want, and the intelligence part that takes all the information and applies some algorithms to, to decide what is the best action to, to do at the time. At the time. So the, the, these are, I would say, totally separate applications. One is a web user interface, the other is a database, and the other is some logical algorithm. But we know that the best place to run all of the three of them is on the same server. So we deploy them on the same server. So actually, the software and the hardware architecture go in pairs. We have the nodes, we have the sensor, we have the devices, and we have the software that runs on those and interact with, with, with the devices that we, we list. Hmm? There are two points of view of the same. And then we have some requirements about the network architecture. We could say everything is connected through the internet, but it's not true. We have uh, some wireless sensors that are not powerful enough or not intelligent enough to have an IP address. IP and Wi-Fi consume too lot, uh, too much energy. So the, you will find no wireless device that uses Wi-Fi and uh, uh, TCP/IP unless they are also connected to a power source somewhere. They will drain batteries very fast, and so they will use a lot of low power uh, network uh, radio protocols. Difference. So they will create mesh networks, uh, 
there's also there's a lot of different network networking technologies no, for for this kind of devices. But it's not IP. Hmm? It's not Wi-Fi. So we have we have a, a network for the sensors. Then we have the local network in our house. Probably we will have some Wi-Fi network and likely also some wired connection between maybe the router and the, and the home gateway. We assume that the router will be able to give internet access to all of the devices that are inside the house. So the local gateway can access the, uh, the internet, in particular the remote server, the central server. The mobile application can access the server through the home network, and so on. The phone can be connected to the local Wi-Fi or to the general let's say, cellular network, the 3G network. Do we support all the functions in both cases? Or are some functions only allowed if I'm within my Wi-Fi? And only a subset of functions are allowed if I'm outside my house. So I'm not under the Wi-Fi coverage. I don't know. We, we, would, we would need to go through the functional requirements and say, OK, this doesn't make sense if I'm not in my house. Um, and it only needs to connect to the central server. So as strange as it may be, the phone and the local gateway are on the same place, but they don't talk to each other in our architecture. Not directly, at least. Hmm? Uh, there is also some problem that uh, uh, the local gateway is uh, inside your house. It's local. But it needs to be contacted by the central server. So the central server should be able to send to the local gateway some commands, say, start playing music, for example. So for the local server to send the sensor data to the central server, it's OK. It just needs internet access. But for, for the central server to send commands to the local server, you need a way from an outside machine to go into your home network. And so you must find some tricks, configure your, your router with port forwarding, open a tunnel, a VPN between the two, or something like that. Something about some, some computer network tricks, OK? Some network configurations. We just need to, be, to list them. Uh, in Polytechnico, we also have a, a, a complex network. So there's the Wi-Fi, there's the, the network in the lab. There will be a Wi-Fi. Uh, connected to our ras raspberries directly in the, in the lab. And all of them are, have different filtering addressing schemes. And so it would be important to, since the very beginning, understand who needs to speak to whom in order to also to do the design of the network infrastructure. Does the network give visibility? Does the visibility? OK. Otherwise, we need to find a way around it, find a solution for allowing them to talk if some network is blocking it. There are solutions for everything. Uh, but we, we must raise the, the, the problems as soon as possible. OK, so this uh, will be the, um, let's say, the, the best, uh, the, the, um, the most part of the next deliverable after that. There will be also some detail about the component selection, but uh, we'll talk about this uh, in the next time. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you.